Well, hey, everybody. Welcome to the podcast, Creatives Who Thrive. I'm your host, Devin Berryhill, and this is the show where we tell stories from artists who make money to make more art. And so today, I'm really excited about our guests, like I always am very excited about our guests. But this one uh, is a person that I met. Um, he's played in a lot of different groups that I knew uh, growing up. He's a producer, songwriter, guitarist, singer. I know him as a great bass player, um, but just an all-around great guy in the music business, also in Christian worship music as well and just a perennial uh, person, well-rounded, someone I highly respect and um, really patterned my life after a little bit too. So anyway, I want to welcome to the show, Bill Batstone. Bill, welcome. I got to show everybody that if there's musos watching us, I got to show them this t-shirt I have. So. Please do. I love the shirt. Okay. Those are difficult times. Anyway. I can't tell you the last time I, I played in 13-8. No, I never have. I don't think. I played in, yeah, I played in five. Can, can you tap that out for us and count? I think it might be like a one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, something like that. Ah, okay. No, yeah, that's, good. I mean, that was one way to do it, I guess. Probably. For all you music uh, theory rhythmic <laughs> geeks out there, there you go, 13-8. You heard it here. Well, cool. Well, like I said, Bill is someone who's been perennial. Uh, I like that word perennial because I've watched Bill's career, again, my entire life. He's been an example. And Bill, if you could just kind of give us the condensed story of, you know, how did you first discover that you had a creative gift? Give us the story and, and bring us up to today. Just uh, probably just growing up in a family of, of faith. Uh, and my my mom was a pretty good singer and piano player, not real public. I mean, we had five kids in that in the family, so she was really busy. Then there was not, she grew in the denomination we grew up in, there was no music, wasn't you sort of played piano maybe Sunday morning or something. And she wasn't, she had too many kids to really do that. But uh, when my dad would, was a, traveling salesman he would go on the road and my mom would would like play us to sleep at night with a we had a, a, a little piano in the house and you know the tv was you know we didn't we didn't even have a tv you know it was a very conservative family and um, we didn't have a tv and so my mom would just play at night and we'd go mom can you play uh, blessed assurance or something we, you know it, it was all hymns and uh, so that was some of my earliest memories of that are that stuff and then just church music in general and being able to I could sing harmony when I was a really young kid because hmm. I'm sitting next to my mom who's a, a had a good ear for alto and music and then a, a real pivotal thing is my dad bought a really cheap uh, tube uh, stereo from Sears it was like a silver tone thing with you know it was like one this box with a speaker detached speaker that would be the, the left side and then the right side was part of in the guts of this thing and it was, right. a, it was a vacuum tube it took a while to warm up it was probably about six watts but <laughs> he, with that he bought uh gershwin's rhapsody in blue that you know was like played by some monster it was you know on columbia or something and then and then another one uh grieg piano concerto in a minor do, 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 do. Well, that, that would be it anyway you recognize all this Real popular, and then Rock sure. Minor Rhapsody on a theme of Paganini, you know, wow. all these. Uh, and so, we, as kids, we just wear these records out, scratch the heck out of them, 
and uh, dance around the room to, you know, to da 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 we you know, it was, it was like a, a large family and, you know, no TV. And so we'd, we'd make up uh, little dramas and, uh, and stuff like that. And to, mm. all to, to this music. And then I got music lessons when I was in elementary school, which doesn't happen. Uh, it, you know, it was a, got a clarinet and took, uh, took lessons. Uh, you know, a huge thing was moving to Hawaii as a kid. My dad was a, in sales. Okay. I took a job in Hawaii. And mm. almost as soon as we got there, he bought us all ukuleles. And then I started taking ukulele lessons from an Air Force lady down the street. And this was in the early 60s. Oh, and, uh, Hawaiian radio, once I learned how to play a little bit, I realized I could tune up to the radio, you know, mm -hmm. tune the uke to the radio. And then Hawaiian music's very simple. You know, it's one or it's, it's two chords. That Most of them are two chords. And then there's four once in a while. So a kid can play along with Hawaiian radio. And back then, this is all really traditional you know, stuff. So anyway, that was kind of it. Uh, just that's how I got interested in and then getting you know getting encouraged by teachers and things along the way music teachers and, and things in school anyway. wow you know i like what you said there about um you know you you grew up in a family where you didn't have tv so it kind of sounds like it forced you guys to kind of entertain yourselves you right. know you had to create your own well what are you going to do tonight well we'll all sit around the you know the living room and sing four-part harmony kind of thing you know <laughs> Yeah, it was a little bit like that. Yeah, I think yeah. we we eventually got a, a at some point we did get a TV, but but that that was already embedded. Of like we make you know you kind of make up your own fun and and fun with music and and yeah. so my parents loved that. So you know singing in the car and stuff. Anyway. I think that's something for today's uh, generation coming up of of kind of limiting the the media access, if you will. You know, obviously with our <laughs> phones and everything you know we don't want to be those guys that are like ah, get rid of the ipad but you know right, yeah, yeah. there is a certain amount of um there's a lot of time that we spend on social media and so many things that really kind of can detract from uh songwriting or learning your craft you know and, and and i think your story is definitely where you those most formative years of your life were spent honing your craft at a right. very young age, plus getting music lessons in, uh, you know, probably right. element and elementary yeah. school, uh -huh. huge part, probably of a foundation that you were able to then later, you know, build on. So after, so you, you got in high school and that kind of thing. What, what, what was your main instrument after ukulele? Uh, guitar or high school uh, guitar. Yes. I was, uh, you know, popular music was not really, allowed in our house that much. I mean, it was, I didn't, we weren't like playing rock and roll in the house until maybe I was in junior high. And then my mom, it drove my mom crazy. You know, my dad too, my dad was out, was working and everything, but you know, it wasn't really like a, a deal, you know, I didn't, but the, the era of the sixties was, was kind of a, a fun era as far as I sensed like a spiritual sort of yearning in the music. There was a sense of like, Kind of altruism. I mean, you have the you know manic uh, themes of the day, the psychedelic kind of dullest, dangerous you know stuff coming down the pike. But I think a lot of it was rooted in kind of a, a yearning for spirituality. So there was this kind of a magical sense of that mm -hmm. era. And so for sure. a Christian kid, you're kind of I, you sense that kind of like uh, well, this is sort of transcendent. This music and these people are enlightened and. So that was real attractive, and so I, 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 you know, the music of the '60s really hooked me in, and the radio of the '60s was that it kind of it went from the top forty thing, and then also this whole underground thing started coming in in '66 or '7. Mm -hmm. You had DJs that were like your friend uh, or older mentor, guys who had been jazz DJs in in New York and San Francisco, and then they some for, for whatever reason ad are adapting this new hippie music into their Stuff so so they were like an education uh, happening. So they would play like the blues. It was a very free form. It wasn't all programmed. And this is like little stations that you could barely get. You know, like KPPC and Pasadena. Uh, KMET kind of came in later, but there was these mm -hmm. college radio stations and things that I would just okay if I put my radio up against the window in a certain way, I can pick up uh, Pomona College 
radio and, and then they have student programs and interviews with local entertainer or you know artists and stuff it was just it was a it was kind of a, a the wild west a little bit what were some of your early influences there you know you're starting to get some of that you mentioned like blues and stuff so you probably have some some artists and influences there right yep um it was all uh i was really attracted to the early kind of singer songwriter stuff not so much the beatles i the beatles were there they were so huge it was but I went to the more of the Simon and Garfunkel and the folk world because it was a little safer to have around the house. I guess Steve sure. got in, you know, <laughs> rather, rather than, you know, the Jimi Hendrix records, which I love too, but I, I wouldn't, they wouldn't be out in the living room, you know, hanging out. It was just the, the artwork was too provocative and it was too, no. too loud. Where it's like Simon and Garfunkel or, or something like that sounded good. Back then, yeah. the, the radio was was very diverse. It wasn't, it, you know. Yeah, my my wife, um, uh, her family gravitated towards that kind of story. You know, when you tell that story, it's like when I started dating her. I remember walking in, first thing was, you know, her dad was a huge Bob Dylan fan yeah. and uh, Simon and Garfunkel. I mean, it was all the acoustic stuff. They like musicals. Did you grow up watching musicals, Oklahoma and all that kind of stuff? Only we'd go over West play, Side Story. We'd go play cards at at you know neighbors' houses, and they had all that stuff going constantly. And it was yeah. all, uh, his West Side Story was was huge. Right. Andy Williams, because the mom would be you know put it on during, and we'd be playing Monopoly or or whatever games. Yeah. Friends' house didn't happen yeah. in my house so much. The the themes were weren't weren't cool to my parents. You know, it was just. Uh, you know, like a West Side Story, they're going, you know, these young punks and, you know, they didn't want to encourage that. But the song, the music is incredible. The sound of music and all that stuff was always playing. Oh, sure. Anyway. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So you're an up and coming musician. Again, what was your, your I'm trying to get to where you are. You, you join a band or something. I mean, all of a sudden it's like, hey, I'm going to play with a group of other musicians. How'd that happen? Uh, I, I was just like a, a solo acoustic guitar practicer in my room. I, I would tune my, learn how to tune the guitar up to the records that I liked, you know, whether it would be Buffalo Springfield or, or uh, uh, whatever, Aretha Franklin records. I, you know, learn how to tune the guitar to that and just practice along that with that all day. And then I, w I had a music theory class in, in my senior year of high school and I met uh, one of my best friends in life. And uh, he was a, he was a genius, jazz yeah. piano player, uh, jazz guitar player, but he loved rock everything R and B, rock and roll. He turned me on to like Ray Charles, um, R and B. Uh, he he loved everything, and uh, so he kind of drug me along and tucked me into uh, being in, putting a band together because I would have never done it on my own. I just wasn't that kind of kid, you know. That there wasn't. I mean, I was. A, I wouldn't have started a band on my my own. I gone. Gee, I'm. I like music. Because I was crazy about music, but I had no idea how to, how do I get in that world? There was a band, a bunch of band guys in my high school, but I, I didn't play electric guitar or anything. Well, anyway, this this friend of mine, drug me into his world, which w involved garage bands and forcing me, forcing me to to play bass. Uh, well, I started out as a guitar player, and then he he forced me to play uh, play bass because I wasn't a good enough guitar player yet. <laughs> and concurrently. My church hired a like a youth pastor guy who was a guitar player, but he was from he was from the South, and more like a Marty Robbins, you know how an Elvis kind of early Elvis and Marty Robbins kind of, but he was oh, really yeah. great, great singer and great, you know, really good player, could play anything, and a, on a guitar, but it was all like, uh, please release me, let me go, you know, he could sing, oh, yeah. He's a really great singer. Oh, and anyway. Yeah. Uh, and he was also really on fire. So there was this two, so I was kind of a, just a church Christian kid. And this youth pastor, for better, lack of a better term, came in and, and just drug me into into playing at the church. And my, my parents were very supportive of that yeah. and bought me a new guitar. You know, it was a, a for 90 bucks, a, a Gibson uh, LGO, solid mahogany thing. It was beautiful. Okay. So, you know, just but like entry level. Yeah. And, uh, that got me going uh, yeah. in the bands and in this whole world. Uh, those between those two things, you know, you 
as I've interviewed a number of uh, guests for the show, and of course I've watched a million documentaries on musicians, oh, yeah. as you probably have, and I love stories and love reading all those things. And so many successful, creative musicians grew up playing or singing in the church. I mean, you brought up um, Aretha Franklin, of course, going to Whitney Houston's and these types. So many people uh, that you, you wouldn't think you know, they grew up in church, you know, even Hannah Montana or whatever, uh, Miley Cyrus, right? <laughs> you know, <laughs> so many of the, I, I was watching a podcast with her on Joe Rogan the other day and she's talking about, yeah, singing in church, dad singing in church, you know, that's what you did. I mean, that's where, that's where people uh, kind of cut their kids. I mean, who else is going to give kids a shot at playing? I mean, there's not like open mic night at the bar, you know, it's usually 21 and up or something or, you know you don't see a lot of opportunities for kids and really one of the few places for young people to get a shot at be, at least even being in the choir, you know, a lot of church choirs. Were you in choir growing up too? No, uh, not until I was in college. <clears throat> and then yeah. that, yeah, that was a really great experience. Of course there's always school. I mean, I was in the, did you ever do like marching band or jazz band at school? You know, I should have no. done all of that. Uh, there's a lot of, that's one thing because I went to a high school that had an incredible music program. Mm. Uh, they had a they had a, the, the top band in the state for a marching band. Then they had amazing choirs and performance groups that you know really really great. And uh, yeah. I had nothing to do with it. You know, it was I don't know. It was just uh, mm. outside of that. There's just so many different ways. I'm interested how creatives kind of come out of where, where do they get their initial start, you know? Right. And I would say hundred percent of them have come out of some kind of community, whether it be a church community or their school, you know, marching band or jazz band or choir or something, or if they're an artist or a filmmaker, they were, you know, part of a, a club on campus, something where they weren't just by themselves, this one, you know, uh, virtuoso talent by themselves, you know, Mozart type, you know, kind of person. Most, most people are their, their careers, if you will, in, in their creative field comes out of community. Wouldn't you say? I agree. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the, uh, huge, another huge thing was, was this was 1970 by the time I graduated high school. And then I, and then in 1970, I was a freshman in college. And at the same time I, I was being encouraged in music at, at church my little local church. And then at the same time I was being, you know, hall, we, with my best friend, we would drive up to Hollywood to hear jazz. We would go to the you know, clubs, the Golden Bear and Huntington Beach, yeah. running around to every, and then my friend was gigging. And so he dragged me into, into gigs, you know, we were doing like wedding receptions and the, in the typical thing, but then the, the Jesus movement came out. Right. We started in the Calvary chapel and my best yeah. friend was a, was a pastor's kid who was pretty rebellious, but then you could, you know, he knew that basically knew what was happening. And so we would, I, we would go to Calvary Chapel and hear the music. And then that was like a template. Oh, that's how you do this. Listen to, you know, and I was totally, you know, I was, I was committed by then. I was kind of going, well, I agree. I totally am on with this. I need to know how to, you know, get connected to this community. And that was a, I made a, definite concerted effort to insert myself into the community of musicians at, at uh, Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa at the time. So there was all these bands and um, they were forming every day. And then there right. was, there was guys that were like my older, these groups like Love Song, they mm -hmm. were my older brothers. Yeah. You know, and uh, that I, you know, they had done stuff that I kind of, they'd, well, they'd been in the army or they'd played in bars and they'd taken LSD and, been a hippies and surfed in Kauai or whatever, and it's the stuff that I thought was cool. And uh, but and now they're totally sold out for their faith, and I'm and I was just kind of going, well, this is what I want to be. I'm gonna be, I want to be like these guys and do do the type of things they're doing and outreach and and that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, of course, that's where we connect a little bit. Um, you know my father, of course, probably right. knew him back in the day. He was part of, Bless actually him. played with Love Song for a little bit. He replaced Jay uh, for, for three or four months. I went on, my first my first tour as a child going with my dad was uh, going to Hawaii with 
Pastor Chuck Smith and Love Song wow. <laughs> doing a tour of Hawaii. I was like, hey, I like this. <laughs> Let's yeah. keep doing that. <laughs> I think I, I had my first opportunity surfing Waikiki on that trip. So anyway, oh, I digress. But um, I didn't know you were from Hawaii, speaking of. How long did you live in Hawaii? Junior three years, just junior high. Well, guy, there's that explains your surfing uh, chops. We we yeah, surfed well, together, I've, of course. I've done, I didn't I didn't learn how to surf until I was like forty eight. But uh, oh. anyway, but then that that I was you know bought the magazine and wore the shirt and all that. You know, <laughs> yeah, so. And I was in the water every day. Hang ten, right? Yeah, <laughs> Hang ten. You had every every in color. Water, every day oh. in in white. Yeah, nice. So, tell us about that. So you get you're getting involved with the whole. Jesus revival yeah. movement revolution as Greg Laurie calls it. Um, so what was some of your first bands? I mean, you got into that and you know, you're in your VW bus. I think I've seen pictures of that on your Facebook, typical uh, tour tour, the official tour bus of uh, Calvary Chapel band, 1971, of course. And um, so what was your first groups there that you were a part of? Well, we started one of my, my, my pal from high school, we started a band called Rebirth and we had a, uh, we actually were good for a kid band. You know, we had a, we had a Hammond organ player nice. and uh, a good guitar player. Yeah. I played bass. Uh, uh, Alex McDougall played percussion for us. Mm -hmm. And we had a drummer, another drummer named Paul Johnson, who later became a pastor, a pastor of a Calvary chapel. It was an associate still around. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, uh, we actually sounded okay. We're kind of a, we, uh, and that, that went on for a while. And I don't, I broke the band up. I don't I can't remember why. I think I wanted to, we played it. We played at Calvary Costa Mesa, but they didn't like us. Um, I, I don't know if this is a reason I broke the band up or not. Uh, or, or maybe I was just being a, like, you know, how you go through, you're sort of a freak when you, when you first kind of come to faith and you're sort of a freak and you kind of, figure you're the only totally dedicated person that, that you know you know i'm the only dedicated guy and these other guys are just are just i don't know what it was but i said i don't want to do this anymore and i wanted to i think what i wanted to do is be more part of like the calvary thing which seemed to be happening rather than us going around and meeting with ambivalence or rejection or something we're just too loud and, and we weren't we were a very tame group but at the time we were loud yeah. so I think that, and, and I don't know, I just feel like uh, maybe I didn't sense the sense of commitment with everybody else. Maybe I felt like I was, I was truly, totally dedicated and I needed to, but I, I don't remember. You're, you know, I was 18 years old and I didn't know what I was doing. But so I started migrating over to, to Calvary a lot and, and started being part of their, their music ministry stuff, kind of weaseling my way in, warming my way in to that. Yeah. To, the connections I'd made. I made, met a lot of these guys, love song guys, a lot of people in leadership over there, and uh, you know, was trying to get involved. As you know, did you go on staff at the church, or were you getting more involved with Maranatha Music, which was Calvary's label owned by Calvary Chapel Church at the time? I just played in That's their band. I, I, I played. There was a one group I was in for ten minutes called Country Faith, and it was with oh, yeah. Tom Stipe and Chuck Butler and Scott Lockwood. Yeah, yep. and. Uh, there, it was pretty cool. I mean, they had some good songs, and and we did some fun stuff. We got to go to England, uh, and then Tom was later in leadership at the at the church, and, and uh, from that I met Eric Nelson, who was a piano player, mm -hmm. songwriter, really yeah, brilliant, you know, writer and and a player and singer. Um, and so I, it was kind of that era, the singer songwriter kind of era, and he and more the Carol King type. Elton John type type era, and he kind of mm -hmm. embodied all that style, you know, like lyricism and but a little bit of you know pretty good energy, and, and it, it was a funny guy, you know, gone to college and and it was kind of a college educated sort of guy, so he was bright and had sort of a sense of I believe this because I of he he knew uh, a little bit about apologetics or he was a very had a very reasoned approach to the faith, which was real attractive to me, mm. and then. So we started a little kind of Elton John trio, and then gradually added other people to that group, and then we're part of the the uh, Calvary Chapel roster of groups. And we used to play at the Saturday night concerts and on a re on a regular basis and stuff. So and then mm -hmm. made a record, and then broke up. So 
and it was. <laughs> That's but, what bands do, right? <laughs> Eventually, yeah. well, you're, you're you know you're 21 years old and you don't know you don't know what you're doing and you just kind of figure I don't know somebody did something you didn't like and then so you just go oh, forget you I'm out of here you know I don't know whatever you know. So how did you transition into making it your career? Uh, where you were able to make a living on how that happened? I just did it kind of covertly. I I, uh, I moved to Los Angeles. Well, I, I I was you know making kind of minimum wage, just playing in, in Christian bands, I and mean, that was like a donation thing. And you know, obviously, you never ask for any money. They would people would just be be good to you, and and, and hopefully. <laughs> and then uh, I moved to Los Angeles because. Uh, I wanted to be part of a, a there was a, a a little denominational Bible school I wanted to go to because I I needed ment I felt like I wanted mentoring you know in the faith mm. Mm. and then plus there was a hit about three other hidden agendas <laughs> the hit, other hidden agendas moved to L A so that I could network in L A and 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 be a player working in L A sure and because that was where the music business was happening so and my best friend from high school. Had gotten married and moved to LA, and so I was I was living in the in West Side. I was living over in Culver City, which was pretty near. The, you know, you could get to Hollywood really easy studios, and then I wanted to to leave behind the Orange County, which I perceive perceived to be okay. That's that's suburbs. It's not LA is where it's really happening. So I really wanted to do that, and I ended up uh, playing a. After our group broke up, I ended up, uh, you know, working with us, some songwriters and things like that, and doing some demo sessions at, at major studios, and getting paid a little bit, and then and then paint, painting apartments in in Santa Monica, uh, scuffling, and then uh, what happened was uh, friends of mine from Calvary Chapel, one friend of mine, Steve Giulio, uh, was a roadie for a band called Souther Hillman Fure Band, which was mm -hmm. a, a band put together by David Geffen uh, for Asylum Records. And it involved uh, J.D. Souther, who was a, kind of in the Eagles Mafia. He wrote, kind of right. wrote, uh, uh, co-wrote some pretty big Eagles hits. Sure. Oh, yeah. Part of this this kind of L.A. Mafia. And you know, he was produced uh, Linda Ronstadt. And he was in that Jackson Brown Eagles kind of a milieu. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, then, in addition to that, then Chris Hillman was was the bass player in the Birds, and the yeah. and he was also in the Flying Burrito Brothers. And Burrito Brothers, the group yeah. I loved. And then uh, they, and then Richie Fure, who was in the in Buffalo Springfield and Poco, yeah. I loved. And Good you know, stuff. The door, and I wanted to be that. I wanted to be those guys. I wanted to sure. be. And uh, you know, Buffalo Springfield was with Neil Young and Stephen Stills, and I wanted to be those guys. And I was sure. just learning how to trying to songwrite and play bass. And uh, my friend Steve Giulio, named nicknamed Bugs, um, was a got a gig somehow. Somebody got sick or fired or I don't. There was some deal, uh, and ended up going on the road with these guys. And then in in the process, well, there was also there was a Christian guitar player named Al Perkins, mm -hmm. who was is kind of a, a sort of country rock pioneer. He was in a band with Don Henley of the Eagles from Texas and then moved out to, to L.A. and, and right. was a session guy. And it was in a group in Stephen Stills and Manassas. He was a steel guitar player in that band. And that was a pretty successful band. And then uh, he was a believer. And uh, so somehow I guess he got my friend Bugs hired to be a road on the road crew for this new band, the Souther Hillman Fure Band. And they had all kinds of backing, big budget, and went out and and, and uh, basically the band was not didn't succeed to everyone's expectations. Hmm. And then in the process, uh, Richie Fure had gone through a personal crisis um, in his marriage. His, his wife had gotten kind of um, fed up with "You're always gone." You know, I hear I'm trying to this, we're, let's start a family and get out of this rat. You know that. Uh, touring, relentless touring, relentless recording, and then plus all the, the party and drug life 
is not conducive to a marriage. You know, that, at that level, there's money and 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 drugs and and uh, and and that kind of fleeting sort of fame thing. And I think uh, Richie kind of hit a personal crisis and then turned to Christ mm. in the middle of that. And then my Al, the steel guitar player guy, the country rock guitar player, sort of mentored and discipled Richie a little bit. And then also then then. Bugsy, my friend, sort of took up the slack in there somehow too, and then Richie uh, started writing Christian songs with by himself, and then with Tom Stipe, who I'd been in a band with, mm -hmm. and uh, that Richie was pumped to write about his faith, and then, and then once he uh, the group busted up as groups do, the Seller Human Fure group busted up, he want, he had a, still had a record contract and wanted to do incorporate his faith into his new new songs he was writing, and. Uh, so I saw this in for this new band. He hired all, all friends of mine. And uh, these are guys from, from Love Song and guys from uh, other bands from, from Calvary Chapel yeah. era. And uh, to I be in John Ma band, Yeah, wasn't that John Mailer and Jay Truex? Wasn't it? Weren't they in that? Yeah. 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 And uh, so guys that I knew and was friends with, and they had they had a major – being produced by major producers, Bill Schnee and Michael Amardi. And, wow. and uh, so it was like, it's kind of a, of a, a thing that I was kind of going, well, I need to be a part of that. And the only way I could get in there was to become a roadie. <laughs> <laughs> so I went on, I did, I toured for a year. Richie went and did a, did a really good album, um, which scared, scared the record company. I think the record company kind of wigged out because it, it was obliquely about faith in a time when the wait we no no that's not going to work for us because the record company we just wasn't ready for that and I don't think they'll ever be really unless it's you two or something I don't know you know that's right. a different story but that was what they were, Richie was trying to do was like a U two type thing where it's it's Christian people you know uh, t speaking to the culture that sort of stuff in his own way and uh, so I went out as a roadie and then. Uh, uh, the bass player quit, and so I I moved I moved to Colorado to be Richie's from Colorado, and I moved out there and basically joined up with with the organization, and then I learned all the music of, that the band played. I learned their whole catalog and just practiced every day. I, I had a little cabin in the mountains and just sat around uh, practicing and and working on music all day, and uh, was able to do that for a while until I went broke, but. Uh, that way I was able to, to, to weasel and audition with the group and got to be the bass player. And uh, so anyway, then he still had a couple options left in his, his contract. And we went and I was part of a couple solo albums that he did. Mm -hmm. And then actually uh, got some of my first songs recorded uh, that way. So it was kind of a backwards way of doing it. Kind of, uh, you know, I'm not a hustler. But I, I I know how to be nice and be friendly with people and, and kind of go be a part of the of a scene without being get that guy out of here. I'm not I, I'm more of a like hey well why don't you come along with us? I can I sort of that's if I have a a gift I sort of like is being part of a team I think uh, and just being in, without being you know uh, obtrusive and and seem like i'm self-serving although maybe uh, you know your motives are you're always trying to like how do i this is happening how do i get there you know and you, uh, that's that's kind of how i did it uh, how i do it anyway i suppose i just kind of like become a team guy and then get get in that way anyway <laughs> that's the, bill that's the whole point of this podcast you just said it in like a minute right there is you were willing to, you were like, hey, I have a goal. I want to be a part of this scene. I want to be a part of what's happening here in music. And you're like, hey, I'm willing to be a roadie for a year. You know, I'm willing to go pay my dues, so to speak. I'm will And through that, they got to know you as a person. I think that's what I'm, I'm hearing you say. Right. They got to know you. Uh, my buddy, uh, you, you know, Leaf, uh, who plays drums for yeah. Jeremy Camp right now. Yeah. He calls it, I've heard him speak uh, a couple of times, you know, a bunch of people ask him, you know, if you don't know who, if you're watching right now, you don't know who Jeremy Camp is. He's probably the large, one of the largest Christian artists, musicians out there, tours sure. internationally. They just had a big movie 
they put out. Um, right. Uh, I think it's called I Still Believe. It was on right. Netflix and everything, Amazon through through the pandemic. But anyway, um, Leaf said, hey, I'm just a good hang, you know? And I think that's what you are. You, you represent, you're a good hang. You know how to hang out and just be a part of what's going on. And inevitably, you know, like you said, in bands, there's always this fluctuation, you know, Every, schedules change, someone's getting married, someone gets sick, you, know, you don't ever know. And it's like, when that moment opens, you were ready because you were in there practicing. Like you said, every day you were in there, pra- you had their whole catalog memorized, yep. probably on guitar and bass. Yep. And, and you probably had the background vocal going too, knowing you. And when the opportunity arose, man, it was like, it's the low hanging fruit thing too. It's like, it's like, well, the band's looking around going, Hey, listen, I don't want to teach somebody the new material. I mean, to sit down and teach a guitarist or a bass player or a harmony. And if you could walk in and you got your parts, they're just going to be like, whoa, because that's money for them. Right. Because right. they're looking at you going, I don't have to spend hours. I mean, they're already exhausted musicians from touring and playing and recording and the, that whole deal is just already a lot. I, I know as a band leader, if when I have to replace a member from, especially from scratch, that's like ugh, such a drag, but someone like yourself comes in, you've got all the pieces, you're a cool guy, easy to work with. You got great, your gear is ready. It's all tuned up. You got good gear. You fit in with the vibe already. You kind of looking like the rest of the band, you know, you got the style going and then, you know, you got, plus you got the talent, you're available. I mean, that's just easy money for the band in a sense, you know. A well, perfect, if you to a thing, fit. At, at one point, I worked with Richie on and off for about five years. And it, working with, we had bands, you know, people quit at the last second and, and oh, well, we got this booked. And, and so we've got to find new players. And we would audition the world. <laughs> and inevitably, you end up finding somebody you know. Because you, they'll have these cattle call. People will get these auditions, and you go through it, and you're just going to go, no, 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 and then, but then you end up with somebody. I was, you always look for people within your community first. That I mean, for a church, if you're looking for somebody to play at church or something, you look, you bring in somebody in from the outside. It's just, it's just, it's hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who you know? I mean, relationship is what you're saying, right? It's like you. If you're already in a relationship with friends, again, going back to that community thing, it's like, I love that movie, the um, the one Echo in the Canyon, uh, Jacob yep. Dylan did with, with Buffalo Springfield and all those guys, you know, that whole scene, Mamas and the Papas, Brian Wilson, you know, all that, you know, there's a lot of collaboration. And if somebody needed a player, it was like, oh, you know, uh, Neil's available, Crosby, Stills, Nash, you know, they want to go more rock. Okay, well, let's bring Neil in. You know, I mean, it was like, it was just there. You right. know, had the gear, had the look, had the songs to talent, reputation, had the had the whole package, was just ready. And, you know, instead of doing the cattle call, it's like, if you can get somebody who's just already there, right? you're, you're going to get the gig. 